Um, hi, colleagues. Thank you so much for all joining. I think we're all here so we can get started while others trickle in. Um, we'll start by just handing it over to our colleague, Ina, um, for some opening remarks. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, my name is Ina Kaloga, and I'm the IRC's Senior Director for Violence Prevention and Response. For more than two decades and across seven different organizations in this sector, I have seen the challenge of empowering people caught in crisis with information. Yet on paper, this seems easy, straightforward. 25 years ago, I was in Guinea. I remember one of my encounters with Yari, a Sierra Leonean refugee woman. I had just directed her to the education and health services she needed as per her case history. Before we parted, she asked me whether I knew where she could find the wholesalers who at the time helped to connect people across West Africa to diasporas across the world for cash transfers. Her sister in Canada was looking for a safe way to get money to her. I did not have that information. I did not even know this was a need she had. Providing information in emergencies seems easy, straightforward. It isn't always for several reasons. First, doing it forces us to decenter house ourselves as actors and the services we provide and recenter not only the populations we serve, but the context they evolve in, recenter the reality of the service availability, but also that of help seeking behaviors, priorities, needs, and choices. Secondly, it recognizes the agency of the person's code in crisis to regain control of our lives one information at a time. Thirdly, it does lead us to interrogate, recognize, and leverage existing information systems shaped not only by tools and technology, but also by social networks, individual and community-based information strategy, which continue to adapt to shocks in ways we are still catching up on. Finally, it challenges our capacity to work from a needs-based rather than sector-based capacity. Therefore, meeting information needs is something we collectively have defined as a priority as reflected in GPC Strategic Priority 4, SDG 16, as well as several ISC recommendations. Despite this, we often struggle to concretely realize it with collective responsive approaches to information services still struggling to take hold in emergencies. At the IRC, we started this work in 2015 in Greece with a rapid influx of refugees from multiple locations, speaking multiple languages, traumatized and trying to stay safe in a new environment. People had arrived with smartphones and their own strategies and capacities, but they were met with megaphones, policy jargon, and, and an information vacuum. Poorly constructed information and communication models were causing riots, were preventing people to access the services they needed, were heightening mental and emotional distress and sowing distrust and discord between refugee populations as well as towards government and humanitarian service providers. At that time, the IRC and Mercy Corps formed a partnership to address this gap. We, beca we began to define success differently with a focus and empowerment and asking ourselves whether this information allowed a person to access the services we were providing or doing a thing we were recommending they do to move into asking ourselves whether the information we provided was useful in making informed decisions on the issues that mattered most to our clients. Yet, two years later, whatever we had learned in Greece was nowhere to be found or seen during the rapid evacuation of Mosul in Iraq. Although we had a recipe for what had worked so well, frontline responders were still lacking the practical tools to support emergency rollout of responsive information to ensure we could reach the hardest to reach and to effectively tap into community networks and partners. For the IRC, responsive information is today a crucial pathway to protection outcomes. We have been addressing this through both specialized information interventions such as signpost, as well as integrating it into our protection rule of law programming with a range of partners. With this toolkit, we hope to continue to challenge ourselves to learn and adapt, but most importantly, we want to be part of consolidating interagency best practices. 
updating standards and bringing clarity to program models and operational tools. We see this as an area of contribution to ISC recommendations towards collective approaches and field tested models to address collectively identified protection priorities. We continue to learn. We continue to learn from all of you. We continue to learn most importantly from our clients. And I am looking forward to hear from all of you here, how you see this work in your context and what approaches we can collectively push forward. Because this is a collective endeavor, we would not be able to do this without you, nor without the support of one of our partners in this, BHA. It is therefore my pleasure to hand over the floor to Hua, Save and Accountable Program Advisor at BHA. Thank you, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to say hello to everyone, wherever you are joining from in the world. We are so glad to have you with us. Let me see if I can get my camera to work. Ah, okay. Never. It, it looks like it's not. Um, my apologies for that. So wherever you are joining from the world, so glad to have you. My name is Hua Yu, and I'm the acting team lead of the Safe and Accountable Programming Team here at the USAID Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance. Uh, I think what I would like to do is just give you a brief welcome, um, especially for making time, thanking you for making time to take part in this very important conversation. And also thanking our colleagues at the Global Protection Cluster for making the space for having these important conversations on lessons learned, but also to discuss challenges and way forward. We know that in a crisis, information can save lives. It sounds like such a simple concept, but as our colleague just mentioned right now, there are so many layers and complexities. Uh, certainly we know that people need information on where and how to access life-saving service, life services, but humanitarians cannot overlook the information needs that are just as vital for protection of affected people, including what their rights are. And of course, there's information needs that we don't even think of that we definitely need to prioritize asking about and hearing from affected people about, such as they might say, the information need that they have is to know what happened to their family members, um, to be reunited, to have some news of what's going back home, uh, to be, to be able to have more information that we may not even have thought would be a need. So one of the things that on BHA Safe and Accountable Programming Team, um, one of the challenges and key issues that we support is this issue as humanitarians in terms of all of the complexities and layers of when it comes to responsive information services and the coordination of these services. Uh, how can we do better? It's just simply how can we do better as humanitarians on this issue? And I'm so excited that we have our colleagues at IRC today um, to lead a discussion on this issue and to also talk about the RISE toolkit. Um, I would absolutely like to acknowledge um, Jenna and the other IRC members who have been leading this effort over the past couple of years and certainly to acknowledge the technical advisory group members who have given so much of their knowledge and experience, wisdom. And then of course, most importantly, our frontline colleagues in Nigeria and Myanmar who really help um, test the operational uh, reality of toolkits like this. I think a piece that is also just as vital is your input your engagement, your thoughts, um, because you are all practitioners, you are all technical experts, and we need to have these discussions and conversations together to ensure that we are doing better in this issue of responsive information um, for affected people. So I'm very much looking forward to our conversation today. Please be active and speak your mind. It is absolutely welcome. You are doing it on behalf of the people we are seeking to serve. So please um, do feel very free to do so. And I'm very much looking forward to engaging with you today. Let me send it back to Jenna and we can get started. 
Thanks so much, Hua and Ina. Um, yeah, really helpful framing for the rest of this discussion. Um, and really happy to have both of you here and to have your support. Um, as both Hua and Ina mentioned, we have been working on developing this toolkit over the past year and a half. Um, I am Jenna. I am Responsive Information Services and Emergencies Specialist. Been working with a huge group of colleagues, including an interagency advisory group, over the past year and a half to, to develop this toolkit. Um, two of those colleagues who have been especially crucial in developing the toolkit, Brianna Orr and Dion Akiyama, are here. Um, Brianna is the Senior Advisor for Responsive Information Services, and Dion is the Senior Technical Advisor for Violence Prevention, Response, and Emergencies. Um, they will be here throughout, and so feel free to direct questions at them as well, um, and we can get started. Um, before we move into the presentation, I just want to mention, just in case you haven't already, if you're keen to listen in French, Spanish, or Arabic, you're welcome to select interpretation below um, on the menu, click interpretation, and, and we have our three amazing colleagues who are um, interpreting the session. You can also use the Q&A function throughout at the bottom of the menu. Brianna and Dion will be monitoring, and so please feel free to, to share questions throughout the discussion. Um, we there, there are many of us here, so we, we might not use we might not have much time for opening mics. So um, please feel free to insert questions there and then we'll answer some of them at the end. Um, so just a quick session overview. Um, in this session, we'll touch on the why for this toolkit. Um, we'll provide an introduction to the program model and the toolkit itself, and then we'll have space for questions and dialogue on its applications in various contexts. So let's start quickly by talking about the gaps that we see this toolkit filling, and many of these were touched on by Ina and Hua already. Um, and, and this is, you know, not new information to protection practitioners in particular, which I'm imagining is many of the people in this call. Um, emergencies often fracture, politicize, or destroy normal e information ecosystems, which means that often information becomes least accessible to those who are most affected by emergencies. And because of this, information is often identified as a critical need with acute demand from, from people at all stages of a crisis. Information is consistently a barrier for people and communities in crisis to access services and legal protections. Safe, meaningful access to accurate information is crucial for people to make choices that reduce exposure to harm, to access services, to know and claim their rights, to locate loved ones, and to identify and define their own path to recovery. Accessing the right information at the right time also has a psychological impact, promoting a sense of safety, self-efficacy, and connectedness. And lacking access to the right information at the right time can exacerbate or cause additional risk. This is repeatedly identified in crises as a tool to deprive affected communities of access to services, fostering negative coping mechanisms, and exacerbating other protection risks, such as gender-based violence, discrimination, trafficking, or restriction of movements. People and communities are more likely to trust information that's responsive to what they need to know and contextualize to their lived realities. Yet, we often see these long pages of key messages delivered in top-down approaches. Um, and the importance of responsive information has been increasingly recognized as fundamental to the achievement of rights. We see this enshrined in global commitments, the SDGs, Grand Bargain, IESC commitments, and GPC strategic commitments. And Yet, you know, collective responsive approaches to information services still really struggle to take hold in humanitarian responses, particularly in emergencies. If communication appears in emergency plans, this is often under-resourced, tied to a particular sector, and framed around awareness raising or improving the accountability of aid, including through behavior change or increased participation of affected communities. It's often about us. And this creates a dynamic that I think we've all seen some version of before where different sectors have disparate communication lines with affected communities, but they're not able to address information needs beyond their sector specific messages. And the information needs of crisis affected people 
just like all of us, but particularly facing an emergency, are complex and nuanced and wide ranging and almost always relate to multiple sectors and multiple agencies. And without dedicated, deliberate approaches that enable frontline responders to solicit and respond to more holistic information needs quickly and effectively, generic top-down messaging will often fail to reflect and respond to lived realities. As you know, mentioned, this program model was actually designed in real time in response to this challenge exactly in 2015 in Greece. Rapid influx of refugees from multiple locations, speaking multiple like languages, and you know, is strategies where there were megaphones and a lot of policy jargon and an information vacuum caused riots and it undermined adherence to beneficial policies, it heightened emotional distress and so distrust between refugee populations and between refugee populations and state humanitarian providers. And the thinking is not necessarily new, you know, as we mentioned, this is included in the GPC strategic framework, the need for interagency approaches for responsive to a communication. But while many quality tools exist to support effective information services, communications, and community engagement strategies, there has not been a widely available programming model dedicated exclusively for responsive information provision in emergencies outside of what has been developed, you know, and what has been happening over the past decade with signposts and pro approaches with partners. Widely leveraged existing guidance mainly seeks to improve the efficacy of aid or focus on specific thematics, such as outbreak context through RCCE. And being a truly cross-cutting protection issue and in line with these ISC findings on the lack of clear collective approaches and concrete programming to address protection priorities, frontline responders have really been left without easy to use operational guidance on how to establish responsive and inclusive information services in emergencies. So now I'll talk a little bit about the program model. Um, in the example that I shared before from Greece and that Ina also spoke to, we really began to define success differently in that where, you know, often we were thinking about communicating with communities or, you know, information programming and emergencies about, you know, did this information allow a person to access a service that we provide or do a thing that we recommend they do? to whether the information we provided was useful and in making informed decisions on the issues that mattered most to our clients. So while responsive information services certainly have important ripple effects for behavior and participation, efficacy of aid, this model is intentionally rooted in empowerment. The goal is empowering clients to be able to make decisions, exercise their rights, access services, and stay safe. Um, and this is how this model is measured um, in an intersectoral and interagency manner as well. So what do we mean by responsive? Um, often, particularly in emergencies, this classic approach of getting information out there through one way, top-down information dissemination is a starting point. But we know that we're less likely to actually meet people's needs for information when we aren't getting continuous feedback on how their needs change and evolve over time. So in practice, this looks like developing informational content based on an initial needs assessment, information needs assessment. And we share this information to our audiences through available channels. Importantly, lines for two-way communication are opened up if they're not already. And clients are able to ask questions about the information that we shared and about their evolving information needs. And as clients are asking questions and we're helping them to navigate information, providing accurate information in response to those questions, we collect data and feedback on the questions most frequently asked and the topics and issues that people are asking about. We adapt the information we provide to fit the needs expressed by the communities we serve helping them to navigate it and proactively sharing information on trending topics. So there's really this life cycle of continuous adaptation, um, allowing teams to keep a finger on the pulse of, and respond to that quickly on how information needs are changing, how they're nuanced for different populations um, and adapting over time. So now I will move into talking a bit about the toolkit. Um, the Responsive Information Services Toolkit is a field-ready toolkit that brings, to 
brings together global best practice and in responsive information and community engagement. It is particularly suited for protection practitioners, but it's applicable to a range of cross-cutting sectors. We know that communication is a core building block of everything that we do in humanitarian emergency response. This toolkit was developed in collaboration with an interagency advisory group who have been amazing and so helpful in making sure that this toolkit is a pulls in best practice from a range of agencies and approaches, but also can be applicable and adaptable to, to different contexts and needs. The toolkit can be accessed online or in an interactive PDF. Um, and I think Brown and Dion can share the, the link in the chat so that everyone has access to it. Um, and we'll share it after the call as well. Um, and the toolkit is meant to be used as needed in the order that's needed and adapted. Um, so we'll talk about this in a second. Um, so on these two points, this toolkit can apply to a range of sectors and end users, and it should not be seen as an all or nothing approach. It's meant to be used as needed in the order needed and adapted. So I won't go through all of these. These are, these are in the toolkit, um, but implementing partners could identify opportunities to operationalize the guidance through an integrated programming rollout approach. So this sort of use and adapt is relevant. This might look like finding opportunities to make existing efforts to communicate more responsive or inclusive. This might look like adding a few information needs assessment questions into broader needs assessments, preparing frontline staff to respond to a wider range of information needs. And in that dialogue, having conversations with frontline staff about the questions that they're hearing most so that we can be responsive to those um, in a cyclical process. Um, you could also look at this toolkit and say, okay, we wanna set up a dedicated standalone responsive information service. Um, there are many examples of this, you know, both with signposts and IRC pro teams, but also you know, other agencies, for example, internews, you'll see examples in the toolkit um, of programming similar. You could also look at this toolkit and look at it as a common service approach. So that might look like multiple agencies and sectors come together to deliver a responsive information service, collaborating on service mapping, pooling funds, et cetera. Um, so another thing to emphasize is that this can be delivered in many different ways. Um, you know, the core, at its core, the most important thing is that there is a channel for two-way communication for people to be able to ask questions and receive verified tailored information in response. And that we have you know, a way to sort of hear that feedback and loop it into the way that we develop informational content to share it back with communities. This program model, you know, in, in thinking about that, um, as you're budgeting for this program model, this is largely focused on human resources. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about what those key roles are. And these might already be covered by your agency or you know, by someone in the response. So it doesn't necessarily mean hiring all of these staff, um, but there are three key roles. The first is frontline communicators who answer questions and help people navigate through available information, show people that they're being listened to, point people in the right direction of available services and report back on trends to uh, to make sure that information materials are responsive to what the clients that they're speaking to need to know. Information producers, this is sort of an editorial role. Um, this profile is, is quite similar in a lot of ways to a journalist. Um, they research information based on needs. So they hear from frontline communicators and they look at the data on what types of questions people are asking and they go out and find it. They have a list of sources who they can contact to verify information. They triangulate information, checking with multiple sources, following journalistic principles. They might work with legal advisors and other technical specialists to draft and edit and verify uh, informational content on specific topics. And then they package information in ways that are accessible and appropriate for the channels that they're shared to. So this might be legal explainers, it might be videos, it might be sharing an FAQ document for frontline communicators. And then there's a service mapping role. Service mapping is a really core function of producing information for responsive information services. Many of the questions that are asked are about services. Um, and this looks like coordinating and, ex and establishing networks with existing service mapping initiatives and other actors to exchange information. 
to establish relationships with service providers and collect information and have consent to share that information publicly. And ensuring consistency in how services are represented, making sure that we're including important information about accessibility of providers so that when a client is presented with an option to access a service, they understand, is this a service that I want to access? Do I think it will meet my needs? And is this a service that I can access? Can I get there? Do they speak the language that I speak? Are there female providers? Um, and again, you know, there might be a service mapping initiative in your context that is really strong, so you don't need this role because this is already happening, but perhaps the tools themselves could be used to strengthen that. Um, maybe there are already frontline communicators who are engaging with clients daily, and rather the task would be to ensure that they're prepared and trained to respond and handle questions. So let's just start quickly talking, just check the time, we'll start quickly talking about the toolkit. I'll, I'll run through it at a high level um, and really happy to move into questions and discussion about the toolkit. I mentioned that and Ina uh, mentioned that IRC and a huge range of partners have been delivering this program model since its inception. And it really formalizes and updates those approaches that have been delivered in many contexts over the past decade or so, while consolidating and harmonizing interagency best practice fit for emergencies. It has three modules with 38 operational tools with, throughout. Um, I'm gonna show the, the images that I'm showing are from the interactive PDF version of the toolkit, which can be used offline, but there's also an online version that you're welcome to click through. The first module is uh, called Getting Started. It provides the foundational knowledge you need to use the rest of the toolkit supports strong understanding of responsive information services advocacy and includes core concepts of participation and inclusion and how to apply them. This module, and you'll see when you open the toolkit, they're, they're split by module, and then there's a section that says how to use this module, and it walks through what's there and with a quick blurb of information of what is here and why might you need it. Um, again, the toolkit is meant to be used how you need to use it, so you don't necessarily need to follow a one, two, three approach, but um, this is meant to serve as the guidance to say, you know, what is it that I need? And then the tools can show you how to do that. Um, this module includes an orientation to responsive information services. It talks about leadership and advocacy for this program model, really covers foundational concepts for inclusion and participation, particularly rights-based inclusion, um, which you'll see mainstream throughout the rest of the toolkit, but we see it's you know quite important for sort of strategic leads and staff to understand rights-based inclusion and opportunities for participation. These draw on approaches from many other um, stakeholders and agencies, and you'll see those linked throughout. In this module, there are a few, and I'll show just some highlights of tools. You know, this isn't everything. There's a, there's a lot of tools within the, this module. There's a training, um, an orientation to the program model, which can be used to train staff or to use yourself to understand the program model. There's a quick um, video, an explainer video, and then there's an inclusion core concepts training, which can be used also as, as a, an overview, but also as a training. The second module, design, provides the guidance and tools needed to assess needs and context and use those findings to shape the strategy to effectively reach your target group with a specific focus on inclusion, coordination, and strengthening and building on existing initiatives. So this module talks about coordination, you know, starting with coordination, who is it that you might be working with throughout using this program model. This is a intentionally cross-sectoral interagency program model, which implies, you know, a lot of, you know, potential synergies and work with other actors. It provides everything you might need to um, assess the communication landscape, information needs, barriers, and preferences, starting from understanding what your learning questions are, identifying secondary data, and what are you looking for, and where might you find it, and then collecting the data you need. There's a survey tool, a humanitarian responder questionnaire, which comes from CDAC adapted, Media station profile questionnaire also comes from CDAC and an INA focus group discussion guide and a reporting template for drafting um, findings and recommendations. Tools you need to conduct a stakeholder analysis, both to understand who might you partner with or engage, and also to understand and inform a risk assessment about particular actors. It talks about defining success and thinking about your the indicators that you'll be measuring or the outcomes you're looking toward. 
and then developing strategies to reach your audience. So there are tools for and, and discussion guides and um, presentations for defining your target audience, understanding how to build partnerships, who is it that you might partner with, why might you partner with them, um, and you know, a range of different actors, including media, determining channels and formats for communication, you know, really also thinking about inclusion and risk, determining what exists and how to build on that. A safety and accessibility audit um, to consider inclusion and safety when accessing your information services and create an action plan for strengthening inclusion over time, which feeds into a project risk assessment. Here we have guides, um, discussion guides and guidance notes for facilitating a risk assessment discussion um, and a risk matrix, matrix template to develop an action plan over time or a monitoring plan as well. Determining the human resources you need, who is it that you need to run this program model? What staff do you already have? Um, who is it that you need to hire? And then formalizing your strategy with budget and um, a strategy and advocacy template, which can be used to start to draft a strategy, but also to be used to share around with other folks to form collaborations to, for advocacy. Again, just a quick highlight of the tools which are included. This is not everything, but you'll see that um, you know, these are meant to be quite easy to use and adapt. So they're all in Word or PowerPoint or Excel uh, formats. So you can take them and do what you need to do with them. Um, there is all of the assessment tools included. Um, there are tools for you to host and manage meetings, to have a stakeholder analysis, to develop a strategy together with partners to conduct a risk assessment. Um, and again, these are meant to be adapted, but they're meant to sort of help you from day one, having, you know, start, you know, invite people to that meeting and then adapt the template um, so you can develop your strategy over time. The third module, Implement, provides the guidance and tools you need to implement, manage, monitor, and adapt responsive information services with staff who are prepared to answer questions and manage interact interactions safely and effectively, and develop inclusive and responsive content and map services. So this toolkit covers everything you might need to implement this program model, and it's meant to be quite operational. And uh, the audience for this module is really frontline staff. Um, so this talks about building your team. What are the things you're looking for in particular in, in these roles? Um, you know, so you see sample job descriptions. These can be adapted to what your needs are. Um, the job descriptions include those for the core functions, service mapping, um, frontline communicator, information producer, and also for a strategic lead, um, which you know could look different in different teams. Importantly, this includes all the guidance and tools you might need to establish standard operating procedures and to train your team. So for producing information, this might look like a workflow, which shows the journey of information from identifying a topic through publishing that information. Who reviews it? Who needs to approve it? How do we get it translated? You know, who is doing that? Um, and so it's really a roles and responsibilities workflow template. A content calendar template comes from internews. This helps teams manage um, their content strategy and plan ahead. Also helps monitor um, content that was produced. So it serves as sort of a list. Um, publishing checklist. This is, you know, a set of rules your team can set for what is it that we will make sure happens with everything that we share. Um, this can really support quality and making sure that um, you've sort of following a set of editorial guidelines for inclusion, for brand consistency, for accuracy. Um, and then an information verification source map. This helps an information producer map their sources, who they would reach out to over time to verify information. This can be really important for this rule. Um, they are often building connections with sources because they're verifying information every day. For service mapping, um, you know, your team might already do service mapping. You might already have these tools. And if that's the case, you don't need this module. But for teams in particular who are, you know, service mapping for responsive information services or who maybe could use, you know, updated tools to manage service mapping, this includes a data entry form template, which walks through the particular questions that you might ask an information a service provider about accessibility. Um, how to make an appointment, Does this, is this service free, who is eligible, what do they need to bring, um, what languages do they speak, et cetera, and then a matrix where that information can be organized and 
you know, potentially adapted to be shared out in different ways. And finally, for frontline communication, this includes a high risk escalation and referral pathway template. Um, information services, unless specifically designed to do so, do not provide case management services. Um, perhaps your team is a, has you know extensive protection expertise, and that's something that you want to do. That would make sense. But many frontline communicators don't have protection expertise, and so it's important that we have an understanding of how to manage uh, clients who reach out to an information service while they're facing a crisis. Um, part of this work is managing expectations that we are not, you know, an appropriate channel to use for acute crises. But always there will be clients who reach out facing acute protection concerns, um, and we need to be prepared to handle those and refer them appropriately. Two-way communication data collection form template. This is how frontline communicators, it's a really simple questionnaire after they speak with a client to document what happened. Again, it's quite simple, but it's to manage, you know, it's to have some data source for the information producer to track what are the questions people are asking? Who is asking those types of questions? You know, do we need to follow up with a client um, to because we didn't know the answer to their question or we didn't have verified information? How do we get back to them? Um, and then tools to, to track that. There are three handbooks and associated trainings for those three key roles. Um, the handbooks are meant to serve as sort of an on-the-job tool for the day-to-day -day work. Um, and in piloting those, we really heard that these were essential for staff in these roles. These are also in Word documents. You are welcome to, to look at them and adapt them, you know, add, you know, adapt what you need for your team. And then trainings, you know, this is a package of modular trainings, um, which can be used to train these key roles. Um, and then finally, monitoring and evaluation tools um, to monitor client satisfaction. This is a set of tools which can be shared as sort of an exit interview as a part of wider client feedback surveys um, or shared online after a two-way interaction. And finally, just how to think about adapting your services based on your monitoring and evaluation data. Again, this is just sort of a, a sneak preview, but um, you know, here are some of the tools in the third module. You can see sort of these uh, groupings of tools for the three key roles. There's the handbook, the training, and then the day-to-day -day tools that they need to do their job. Um, you know, these are tools that are meant to be used as is or taken on day one and adapted over time. Um, there are tools for monitoring and evaluation and a log frame that you can pull the indicators that you'll be measuring. So let me just pause there. Um, let me pull up my um, I see. okay, I will share the um, the toolkit in this chat. Um, so colleagues, I'll, I'll pause here. Um, we are happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, we have about you know 15 minutes to to walk through questions. We're also really keen to hear from you. Um, you know, we've had discussions about how does this, you know, how might this look in different contexts, you know, and what does rollout look like? You know, we see the toolkit as being really operational and ready to be adapted on day one. But, you know, a question that we've been discussing is what is the role of the cluster versus the role of a strategic, you know, predictable strategic partner? How can these protection partners and country level clusters coordinate to cement information services as within the humanitarian infrastructure and as a part of the standard part of the response? You know, we see again, you know, a barrier to this is that it's often deprioritized. Um, and so how how do we work together to put this on the map now that we have you know clarity in a program model and operational tools to use? And how can clusters work with other sectors? Um, you know, there, there are contexts, you know, where signposts or protection rule of law teams work, where this is done particularly well. Um, but this program model is, you know, really cross-cutting by design. Um, you know, it really sits within the centrality of protection. This is something that is a, is a protection intervention, but it is fundamental foundation to other sectors. Um, how can we work with health, AAP, telecommunications, cash, education, other sectors? Um, you know, on service mapping, content development, pooling resources, um, because this is something that contributes to, to all of these. Um, 
There are a lot of us here, so um, I will just ask if colleagues are okay to insert any questions into the Q&A function, um, and then we'll answer some of them out loud. Um, we'll start there before opening mics. Um, And I'll just go ahead and share the RISE toolkit in the chat. Thanks, Jenna. Yeah, sorry, um, I didn't have access, but uh, here and monitoring the Q&A section. Yeah, no worries, thanks. I didn't check that, that you would be able to, I think I had to change a function. I don't see any questions in the Q&A function. Um, feel free to put any thoughts or comments there. Um, I would also be really curious if you know colleagues have thoughts on the answers to these three questions. You know, we really, as we roll out this toolkit, we're really keen to sort of see and discuss how this might work in different regions and different contexts. Um, I think I'm, you know, particularly curious to hear if there are protection cluster coordinators here, if you have thoughts, um, and yeah, really happy to hear them. Yeah, Brianna, go ahead and come through. Yeah, no, I was just going to highlight there's um, one question in the Q&A. Um, if you want to speak to that, Jenna, if not, I'm happy to give it a stab. Yeah, go ahead and then I'll come through after. I think there might have been some work in uh, signposts, which maybe you're not uh, so connected to, but otherwise happy to talk to it as well. Um, great. So the question I'm seeing in the Q&A, which hopefully other folks um, can see as well, says that in some contexts in the early stages of the outbreak of con conflict, and Sudan is given as an excellent example, one of the big challenges was outage of internet, electricity, and phone lines. This made information sharing difficult. Um, such a good observation. Um, and I think, you know, that assessment of uh, which ways of getting in touch with people and opening opportunities for two-way communication are going to be most appropriate in a given context is really key. Um, it's interesting because Sudan is mentioned, it's interesting that Sudan is, is mentioned as an example. I work on um, the Signpost Project that Jenna mentioned, and we actually have a signpost program in Sudan that's delivered in partnership between Internews and NRC. And that's been interesting to see take shape because NRC already had frontline communicators on the ground responding to questions face-to-face -face. and paired with an online approach that sort of worked well. And they were able to dial up one um, and the versus the other at different moments when there were internet outages, etc. So I'm glad that that's being offered as an example. I think it's a really interesting one. And Jenna, maybe you want to speak a little bit more to just how that shows up in the toolkit specifically. Yeah, thanks. I think this is something that comes up, you know, in Sudan, but also, you know, there are many contexts where working digitally is really challenging. And even where there are you know, where digital approaches can happen, there is connectivity, there's internet, you know, some people have access to devices. Um, there will always be people who are left behind by digital approaches and, you know, particularly in a context like this, where at some points, many, many, many people would be left behind by digital approaches who don't have internet, electricity or phones. Um, the toolkit itself is meant to decentralize um, digital approaches, you know, digital approaches are 
an awesome, awesome option. And this is something that Signpost really specializes in and does really well. But both Signpost and you know how the toolkit is structured is to ensure that you are also that you have options presented to you about how you might implement responsive information services offline. Um, you know, an example of this in Myanmar when the toolkit was piloted was embedding an information desk in a health center of a partner um, in this context where there's an outbreak, you know, potentially there are IPC considerations where we need to think about how to keep people distanced. Um, but certainly, you know, I think this model for face-to-face -face communication is something that will always be important. Um, and I think the toolkit, you know, will offer those, those comparative approaches. Colleagues, any other thoughts, um, particularly on this question about clusters? Um, you know, do cluster do anyone who's here who is a part of as a partner in a cluster or as um, you know a cluster lead? Do you have thoughts on how you can see this in your context? How you can see this rolling out? Um, we have some time, so please feel free to you know raise your hand, and we can open mics as well if, if it's not easy to to type. Alice, I see you. Let me just. Okay, Alice, go ahead. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Can you hear me? Ah, it's Lije. Hi. Yes. <laughs> Hi. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I was like, okay, with this question, maybe I can answer and break Please the do. ice. <laughs> we yes. had a conversation last week about it. Uh, for everyone, I'm Alice Continue. I'm the coordinator of the protection cluster in Venezuela where we actually are now trying to figure out how to gather information, how to communicate with communities. Uh, so uh, I think this is a really useful kit, a kit or toolkit in a, in a situation like this, where um, reaching community, communities is getting um, more difficult because of the current uh, well political situation. People are scared to talk, people are scared in some parts of the country to receive humanitarian organizations, but there is still some communication through um, messaging, but at the same time, uh, WhatsApp is getting even harder to, to reach out to people. So uh, there are some, some suggestions, there's some work that is done at HCT level and the AAP working group, but something like this, I think, uh, where we could involve different structures, you know, from a protection cluster coordinator, there is an AAP working group, there are local partners, there are grassroots organizations and communities that could actually uh, reach people. I think it could be a good use for us in, in this situation where we cannot just go and ask certain questions or we cannot just go to communities and... and and talk freely about protection issues inside of the community. Um, so yes, yeah, strengthening with other areas as well. So now, uh, well, a lot of partners were doing it before the elections, but after election, it's getting even more difficult to uh, do health activities uh, together with psychologists, uh, psychologists and, and social workers in order to be able to work in the community and to uh, also uh, bring protection activities into the community. Uh, so in that sense, I think that in certain contexts, it could be a, a useful way to actually have this two-way communication with communities on one side to understand what their needs are and their protection needs are and understand what protection analysis we can, we can do. And in the other way to maybe communicate with people without putting them at risk, which is our concern right now. Like if we go into the community, we could possibly put some some of the people or community leaders at risk. Um, we are identifying certain uh, protection risks in the community, but of course it's, it's harder if you cannot really talk to people freely, no? Yeah, 
Yeah, thanks very much, Alice. And and yeah, Alice and, and I and, and others have had some discussions about how this looks in a context like Venezuela. Um, you know, as I mentioned, the toolkit was piloted in, in Myanmar, which is a, a quite a challenging information environment. Um, and how I see this is that this toolkit and this program model is a framework to bring people together around to have discussions. So, you know, there's assessment tools for you to ask the right questions to understand, you know, what is it that we're working with and how can we reach people? There are tools to sit together and have a discussion about risk. Once you sort of understand how can we reach people and have those conversations, who are our frontline communicators? Are we mapping services here? Can we, um, and, you know, over time that, you know, those decisions might change, particularly in a, an environment like this, but um, I, I think the sort of instinct to involve other colleagues like AAP Working Group Health, you know, other teams who have also a focus on getting people information and communication um, and trust, particularly in these contexts, can be really useful. Um, Florian, I, I see your question. Um, one introduced question, is there space to adapt the tools to increase coordination with local media that might be providing information to the affected communities, especially in terms of local media being able to access humanitarian information and understanding the risks of providing information in crisis contexts? Certainly, well, I'll answer your first question. Certainly, yes, the tools are meant to be adapted. Um, so, you know, sort of pressing further on this point is absolutely welcomed. You're you're welcome to sort of adapt. I will mention that um, internews, you know, tools from internews and others, you know, BBC Media Action, who have, you know, talked about collaboration with media, you will see in the toolkit. Um, in the information production handbook, there's a section about working with media, formal collaborations, informal collaborations, accessing humanitarian information. This is covered there in some of this guidance. Um, understanding the risks of providing information in crisis contexts. I see this as bringing local media into risk assessment discussions, um, but certainly, yes. And you'll see, you know, in the risk assessment tools, one of the, you know, the sort of facilitators notes says, you know, here are some stakeholders you might bring within. Um, so anyway, a bit of a roundabout answer to say, I, I think this is there in some ways, but certainly can be adapted. Um, and also would be really happy to sort of hear where you think that that might happen um, for our teams who use the tools. Um, Sukena, as CP AOR coordinator, I can see the difficulty to share much needed information versus exposing the communities when the environment is not very ready to accept the right of information to all people. Um, exposing the community when the environment is not right, yes. So I, I think how I hear this is that there are often um, certain actors in communities who do not want people to have access to information. Certain groups, all groups, you know, this could be politically motivated, it could be about gender, it could be about um, certain groups within a community. Um, yes, this, this happens often. And so I think when we're sort of centering this discussion about, okay, what is our approach? You know, in an environment like this, we would have a discussion about risk. Um, in this discussion, we would know that there are some people, A, who might not be able to access the communication channel because they can't be seen looking for that information. So what are our options there? How can, how can we get information to people more privately and allow them to access information in a way that does not put them at risk or lowers their risk? The second would be, what kind of information can we share publicly versus what kind of information do we need to share privately in one-on-one -on -one conversations? Um, an example of this, you know, that we've seen in response to information services is we, you know, in a certain context, we uh, abortion services could not be posted on a, on a public service map, but they did exist in this context. Um, and so, you know, they were included when, when a client came to the information service um, so, uh, yeah, I think this is common and I, I understand that question. Um, all right, well, it looks like we, we have gone through the questions. Um, thank you for the space and the time and just for joining to, to hear a bit about the toolkit. Um, we are really happy to keep the discussion going. Um, you'll hear that in the fall, we're planning some dialogue events, regional dialogue events in East Africa, Latin America, and Asia. Um, 
there are certainly plans to to engage protection coordinators and clusters um, in some way, whether partners or cluster coordinators in those discussions. So that will be an interesting opportunity to sort of see how this um, could be rolled out in the future in these contexts. Um, we've shared the toolkit with you. Um, currently, it's available in English. Um, it will be available in French, Spanish, and Arabic. And um, you're welcome to put your email on that list for us to share that with you when it's available. We'll share it out so you might receive it multiple times, but just to ensure you're notified when, when it's available. Um, and yeah, I'm including my email here. I mean, there are many others who are involved in this work, but I'm happy to sort of direct emails internally um, if, if you're interested to discuss further, to collaborate with Signpost, to understand if there are responsive information services in your context um, or any questions about the toolkit. But thank you very much for your time. Um, and I hope you all have a nice rest of the day.